Okay, you can see my presentation? Um, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, so in that case, I'll just start. Uh, my name is uh, Konrad Miazga. I'm from uh, Poznan University of Technology, Poznan, Poland. And today I will be talking about the diversity control and evolution of movement. So I will start with our motivation. And our motivation was that uh, at our university, we perform a lot of evolutionary experiments in artificial life. We have a framework in which we can evolve uh, three-dimensional creatures and we can evolve them for various tasks. However, what we notice is that over repeated uh, evolutionary runs, uh, there is convergent evolution. Uh, that means that over many runs, we get to the same uh, morphologies, the same behaviors, even though we would like to see more behaviors because in artificial life, we like diversity. And in nature, there is a lot of diversity. Of course, there is convergence in uh, behaviors uh, as well. However, because of, for example, different uh, ecological uh, niches, uh, there are different modes of movement that uh, we can achieve. So this is what we want to uh, uh, obtain here. Of course, we could just change the environment uh, to uh, get different types of movement, but we want to see if we can achieve different interesting types of movement just using uh, the same environment, but uh, uh, just uh, increasing diversity of uh, behaviors. So we want to find novel modes of movement for creatures of unrestricted. And for that, and uh, we are using FRAM6 environment, which is general evolutionary algorithm and artificial life framework. It facilitates simulation and evaluation of three-dimensional creatures. Uh, it has been developed since 1996 at our university by Dr. Komisinski. And uh, in FRAM6, uh, we can encode uh, both body and brain of a creature in a genotype. And we have many different uh, genetic representations. When it comes to body, body is composed of sticks that are tied together by joints. And then there are muscles that uh, can be placed, placed in those body parts. And uh, we have two different types of uh, engine uh, that we use. One is other. And the other one is native to uh, Francistic, which is Mechastic. Usually we use Mechastic because it allows for more elastic connections between parts, and that allows for more natural movement as opposed to other, which is better for uh, robotic simulations. As far as uh, the brain of those creatures, uh, the, the brains are realized as recurrent uh, neural networks with uh, sensors and effectors uh, such as for example a sense of touch and uh, muscles and uh, that way uh, we can use uh, those neural networks as a way to uh, control the movement of uh, those bodies and using uh, this framework we can uh, evolve many different behaviors uh, such as for example a, sim a simple example running uh, however we would like to introduce some diversity and there are many ways uh, to introduce diversity in evolutionary algorithms, uh, such as uh, niching methods, so fitness sharing or crowding, or quality diversity methods, such as novelty search or map elites. Uh, in this work, we will be using uh, simplified versions of fitness sharing and novelty search, uh, but we would like to investigate other uh, algorithms as well. Uh, however, uh, what both uh, fitness sharing and novelty search require is some notion of novelty. So we need to be able to distinguish uh, between two creatures and uh, how similar or dissimilar are they their behaviors. So there are two main ways we can do that. One way would be to uh, calculate genetic novelty or dissimilarity between two creatures. And we could do that. Of course, it is uh, easier to uh, calculate genetic novelty when we are using uh, uh, binary representation. In FRAM6, we do not have binary representation. Instead, we have uh, types as strings. So we could use, for example, Levenstein uh, distance. 
However, a better option is phonetic ability because here we can compare uh, exactly phenotypes of those creatures, not just genotypes. So there, there's an option here. We can compare their bodies or behavior or both of those. In this work, we are uh, focused on the behaviors of those creatures. So we want to uh, compare uh, the types of movement that they perform. And to that end, we will use uh, the set of properties that we have introduced uh, two years ago at a live conference uh, in paper measuring properties of movement in populations of evolved 3D agents. There, it is a set of uh, seven properties. And uh, for those properties, uh, so we can uh, compute them, we need to have a uh, data. Uh, specifically, we need to uh, have a, a series of positions of each body part uh, at all times during the simulation. Once we have uh, this uh, data series, then we can uh, compute the following uh, series that uh, summarize uh, those body, pos uh, body part positions. And these are a series of the body center of mass position time C, a series of instantaneous speeds in time delta C. And this is instantaneous speeds in time uh, as not to be mistaken with, for example, velocity, uh, because uh, we simply compare position at time T plus one uh, with the position at time T. That means that uh, a creature can have a high instantaneous speed if it is jittering in place. It does not need to be running around and can just jitter in place. Uh, this instantaneous speed will still be quite high because uh, we just compared to uh, following time steps. And then uh, based on this uh, vector delta C, we can compute a former Fourier transform and we get this data series F. Also, we compute uh, two uh, data series of body dispersion, one for xy plane, this is dxy, and one for uh, z dimension, this is dz. Uh, and this uh, vector of body dispersion basically tells us uh, how uh, dispersed is the body of the creature uh, during uh, the simulation. Uh, so it is computed as a standard deviation of uh, position positions of body parts. And uh, in this vector, we can see whether it, uh, the creature uh, stays uh, uh, dispersed uh, during the simulation, or maybe it stretches out. So based on uh, these uh, five uh, time series, we can compute uh, the following measures. I will not go into detail uh, here. Uh, for each of those, uh, I'll just uh, quickly mention them uh, so we have general idea what we are using. Uh, we use airline XY, which answers the question, how linear is the path of movement of a creature? And it is computed as a mean error of the linear approximation of the path of creature's movement. Then we have var this XY. It tells us how much does the creature stretch horizontally. So basically, if uh, at some point in time, uh, uh, body dispersion of a creature is slow, and at another time it is high. That means that the type of movement that this creature performs involves some kind of stretching in this xy plane. We can compute a very similar thing for the z dimension. So this is var this z and tells us how much does the creature stretch. And then we can compare those two with one another and get the ratio of vertical to horizontal stretchiness, which it could be said that it tells us how vertical is the movement of the creature. Then we have instantaneous speed. And as I mentioned uh, before, uh, as this is computed as a mean value of this vector of instantaneous speeds, it does not tell us the velocity of a creature, although it might be correlated with that. It only tells us how rapid is the movement of the creature. So it can be jittering in place or running in circles. Uh, and still have high value of this uh, property. Then we have uh, spectral flatness of the Fourier transform of creature speed, which basically tells us how complex is the movement of the creature. The movement of the creature is very complex and it cannot be easily uh, translated to a sum of a few sinusoids. Then uh, the spectral flatness will be high 
On the other end, if it is very simple movement uh, where the speed is constant because, for example, the creature is rolling around or has very repetitive uh, movement, uh, which can be uh, summarized with a sensoid, then the, the spectral flatness will be low. And the last measure is Fmax, and it tells us what is the most prominent non-zero frequency in the creature. Once again, we base it on this Fourier uh, transform of instantaneous creature speeds. Okay, uh, so uh, as for the experiment, uh, the main goal of the experiment that we uh, wanted to perform was to find out how does the behavioral diversity control influence the evolution of creatures. Namely, uh, does it increase the diversity over multiple runs of the best creatures that were found? or maybe it improves the fitness, or maybe uh, the shape or behavior of those creatures is somehow more interesting than it would normally be. So basically, we use diversity control techniques in evolution. Uh, then we uh, have a number of uh, independent evolutionary runs for using these methods, and then we select the best creature from each individual individual run. Then we have those creatures and we compare them against each other and against the baseline, where the baseline is no diversity control. So basically we have these three uh, diversity control schemes uh, that would be none. Uh, then we have uh, niching. Basically uh, what we are using as niching is a simplified version of fitness sharing and a simplified uh, novelty search. As for the experimental setup, uh, the parameters of the algorithm are as follows. We are using generational evolutionary algorithm with population size of 100, 5,000 generations. We are using tournament selection with tournament size of five. Crossover rate is 20, mutation rate is 90, and the goal in all experiments is to maximize velocity of movement of those creatures. And this uh, velocity is not the same as uh, this instantaneous speed that we take into consideration in our properties, because this is a uh, velocity computed over many, many, like thousand steps of uh, simulation. Then uh, there are also some uh, variable parameters of this setup. Uh, namely, uh, there are two genetic representations that we want to uh, test. F0 and F1. In a second, I will uh, say a bit more about those two. There are two environments, land and water, three diversity control schemes, as I have already said, uh, non, niching, and novelty. And for each uh, combination of those parameters, we performed 10 independent runs, which uh, given that at the end, we select the best uh, solution from each of those runs, gives us 120 individuals that we will compare. Then we have uh, those genetic representations that I have mentioned already. There are more than two uh, representations in Framstix, but these are uh, in a way the most uh, popular. We use them the most. F0 is the low level description. So this is like the most basic uh, genetic representation where each body part is uh, specified directly and all its properties are uh, specified numerically. Also, all connections between those body parts are also specified directly. So for example, this letter J means a joint between two parts, part zero and part one. On the other hand, we have F1 representation, which is a high level representation, and it was designed for efficiency. So here you have an example of this representation and this uh, corresponds to a creature that is in a shape of a letter Y. So we have each X is one uh, stick and we can read it from left to right. Uh, those sticks, uh, each uh, following sticks, uh, stick uh, is bonded to the previous stick. And uh, this parenthesis uh, basically tell us uh, that we have some sort of split in the uh, morphology. For the environments, as I have already, already said, there are two. There is land environment and there is a water environment. And uh, for fitness calculation, 
uh, something that uh, we need to take into uh, consideration is the fact that uh, we have those seven properties, but these properties uh, have uh, different ranges of values that they take. So we need to standardize in order to be able to uh, compute a meaningful distance between the two uh, behaviors. However, uh, we do not uh, know uh, before evolution what are those ranges. So what we do is that uh, after uh, we gather entire new generation, entire uh, new population of creatures, we compute uh, those uh, statistics for these uh, properties, and then we standardize them using z-score standardization. And then we can compute the similarity between two creatures as a sum of absolute differences between these properties. Now that we know how to uh, calculate the similarity between two uh, creatures, in initiating, fitness uh, will be uh, computed as velocity of a creature multiplied by one plus the sum of the similarities to all other individuals in the population. And in novelty, search, uh, we will use as fitness, we will not use velocity at all because like this is the main idea behind novelty search that we are blind to the uh, fitness. Uh, so as, as a fitness, we use the sum of the similarities to all other individuals. And we do not use archive of the most novel past individuals, which is in a way a big part of this algorithm. However, uh, there are works that uh, show uh, that not, not always is it necessary to have this archive and for the purpose of uh, in, um, faster evolution, we skipped this part. Okay. So now uh, I will go over the results. Uh, here, uh, I will start with the results for the similarity between uh, those best individuals from uh, independent evolutions. Uh, here we have a uh, principal component analysis uh, for uh, the behaviors of those uh, creatures. Uh, we are showing only two first uh, most important dimensions. Uh, on these two plots, uh, we uh, show uh, the results for the land environment. Uh, no diversity control are black circles, green squares are niching, and uh, red triangles are novelty. So as we can see, on the left, uh, it seems like novelty actually uh, can lead to a somewhat uh, higher diversity of those behaviors. Uh, however, there is basically no uh, difference that can be seen between uh, the results uh, of niching and no diversity control. On the other hand, when we take a look at the plot at the right, which is F1 encoding, this is this high level uh, encoding, we can see that uh, uh, novelty no longer uh, gives us this high diversity. In fact, uh, what is surprising if anything could be said is that actually uh, no diversity control leads to uh, the highest diversity of behaviors over multiple runs, which is quite interesting uh, and uh, counterintuitive. And now uh, here we have uh, similar plots for water environment, and we can see that uh, the story repeats. There is no clear indicator that any of those methods gives us a higher uh, diversity of behaviors for multiple runs. And one of the reasons could be that, uh, for example, uh, when we are using diversity uh, control, we are finding better solutions, and uh, better solutions have some specific type of uh, behavior that is uh, related to them. And this is uh, why, uh, even though uh, we would expect that uh, novelty search would find novel solutions that are very diverse. Here, when we take a look only at the best solutions, we cannot see this diversity. And uh, to check that, uh, we have plotted uh, the fitness of those best creatures. And what you can see is that there are no very strong indicators that uh, any of those methods is better than the other. Uh, on the uh, vertical axis, we have fitness of uh, those 
of creatures evolved using uh, those diversity uh, control schemes. I think we can say that uh, when are, we are using F1 environment on land, then no diversity control it gives us worse results than uh, we would get when uh, we are using niching or novelty. So there is uh, some implication here that uh, perhaps a diversity control can actually be helpful when it comes to finding high quality solutions. However, when we uh, go to different environment, that is water environment, we can see that this is no longer uh, the case. Uh, non uh, and niching give us a very similar but we get a very similar results. However, what is very noticeable is that novelty search performs very poorly. And this is a mystery. Why is it that on land, novelty search gives us good results, while on water, uh, while in water, it performs so much worse? And one of the possibilities is that novelty search works best when uh, the space of behaviors is somehow constricted. Because uh, then uh, we can uh, check all those behaviors that are possible more thoroughly. And while uh, there is some restriction to possible behaviors on land, because there is gravity, there is this floor that uh, the creature will lay on. Uh, when we are in water, there is no such uh, sort of constraints, and any movement can be performed. It's just that most of those movements will not result in a locomotion. So this perhaps is a reason why novelty search does not work all that well uh, in the water environment. There's another plot that I wanted to show you, and this is uh, the plot of fitness in time. As you can see, a uh, black line is uh, no diversity control, and uh, evolution finds good uh, solutions very fast, but then it usually ends up uh, uh, and it is very hard for evolution when there is no diversity control to escape locomotion. When we are using niching, the evolution is slower. However, it is much easier for evolution to escape those local optima. So we can expect that if you would run those experiments uh, for a longer time, we would see that niching actually outperforms uh, no uh, diversity control. What is interesting is that novel, in novelty uh, search, there is no uh, indicator that there is an improvement over time, which in a way makes sense because uh, uh, novelty search does not keep uh, fit solutions in the population because it does not know anything about uh, fitness. Uh, also, I wanted to show you uh, very quickly uh, some uh, of the behaviors that we were able to uh, Evolve. I will not uh, show everything, uh, but I will just uh, go over some of those. You, you got one minute, come on. So, uh, as you can see, there uh, these are these uh, movement types that we were able to evolve using uh, diversity uh, control schemes, and they are not necessarily the most effective. Uh, they are uh, kind of uh, uh, decorated with unnecessary movements, which makes sense because this is something that we uh, were uh, awarding uh, during uh, evolution. Uh, there is a link uh, in the uh, paper uh, to this video, so you can uh, watch it uh, later at your leisure. But I will just go to uh, the final summary so basically what we have uh, discovered is that diversity control does not seem to necessarily increase the variability of the best solutions over, found over multiple rounds. However, it can facilitate finding good creatures. And uh, effectiveness of novelty search depends on the environment, which is something that we in a way knew already, but this just confirms this uh, finding. Uh, also, behavioral niching leads to slower discovery of good solutions, but it definitely helps escape local optima. And although novelty search can find good solutions, it does not build upon them because they are lost uh, very quickly. And it is better to uh, simply uh, use novelty search as the starting point to find good solutions, which can then be evolved. As for the future work, we would like to uh, see 
if this can be used uh, with fixed morphology. So we can use fixed morphology and evolve only neural network uh, that controls uh, the movement. Then uh, it would be easier to uh, compare those movements because the morphology is the same and uh, it does not, morphology does not influence the values of those. Also, we would like to uh, see if there are some sets of ways of properties that would be especially beneficial uh, towards evolving a high uh, uh, fitness, uh, for example, with higher velocities. And we would like to use uh, the proposed uh, measures with uh, quality diversity algorithms such as MapLeads. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I guess now it is time for questions. Uh, any questions, anyone? Uh, I, I've got a question. Uh, I noticed you had a 90% mutation rate. Um, was there a reason for that? Uh, okay, uh, basically, uh, some, this is something that we have noticed uh, from our previous uh, experiments, uh, that uh, it is good to ha have this uh, high mutation rate. However, if we would have 100% mutation rate, then uh, we would always uh, lose uh, previous uh, uh, solutions because there is no way that uh, some solution would go to the next generation unchanged. When we have this 90% uh, uh, mutation rate, there is a possibility that uh, some solutions will be copied to the future generations. And from our experience, sometimes it uh, helps uh, to retain them for a little bit longer and it helps with uh, uh, it helps to help worse solutions that are, uh, have potential, but are in a bad place right now uh, to have another chance at uh, being chosen for evolution. Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, is that Rory, you've got your hand up. Hi, yeah, can you hear me okay? Um, yeah. yeah, so this is just a, a quick question. I was wondering if you considered using kind of alternating uh, kind of evolution towards a fitness function and then diversity uh, or novelty search to kind of get you out of uh, kind of local optima and then going back to optimizing towards an objective because I think you mentioned that you know the novelty search was good for evolving initial solutions and then sort of refining them with evolution but I guess mm -hmm. could you have a sort of alternating thing where you go back and forth between I guess more convergent and then like divergent evolution? Uh, okay uh as far as I'm aware, there are methods that are doing just that. Uh, and uh, definitely it is a good idea uh, whenever uh, we find ourselves in a local optimum that we cannot escape uh, using something like novel search would be a great way to escape this local optimum. Uh, however, this is just not something that we uh, were concerned with in the scope of this specific work. Okay, uh, one last question. Uh, Emily asks, uh, did you look at diversity over time for different conditions, or if so, was it relatively consistent? Uh, okay, diversity over time. Uh, I don't think we uh, checked that. So uh, yes, this is definitely uh, an interesting uh, thing and it would be good to uh, see that because of course there is this risk that uh, for example despite our efforts there is this uh, convergence uh, we only check the diversity at the end of the evolution and there uh, actually was this uh, sort of convergence it was not full convergence for uh, methods such as niching but it was still not as diverse as, for example, for novelty search because and there is this fitness factor. But this is something that probably we should look into. So uh, that's a good uh, suggestion and we will look into that in the future. Great. Um, we have one more question. I don't know if that's okay. Um, if we've got time. Um, okay, last one. Uh, you don't have uh, an archive in the novelty search. Uh, this is by Susan. Uh, might some solutions be returning to previously explored places in the novelty search space? Uh, generally, uh, this is a risk. Uh, there are some works that uh, show that it is not necessarily uh, 
necessary for novelty search to have archive because yes our, uh, the point of the archive is to make sure that uh, the solutions will not go back however uh, with novelty search uh, the uh, the solutions that are in the previously explored uh, places uh, could be uh, considered within in the sphere we start with a uh, 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 within some uh, uh, point in the space of behaviors, and then we uh, explore space outwards. So uh, behaviors outside of the sphere should generally be more novel than the behaviors within the sphere. So uh, in a way, this uh, should make it that it is less likely to uh, go back to the same places. It does not mean, of course, that uh, we cannot go. Uh, so uh, yes, this is definitely a risk that we are running into here that we can go back and explore the same results so uh, yes probably uh, it would be good to uh, repeat those experiments with use of archive yeah great thanks Conrad. um thank you